Good morning. Welcome to Hub Culture. Welcome to the Ice House. We're delighted to have you here. We're absolutely delighted to have five climate activists for you here. They're each going to give a statement, just in this order. I'm going to announce their, uh, announce their names. Afterwards, we're going to have time for questions. And just so you know, when you address your question, you're addressing it to the entire group. And they're going to decide uh, who will take the question. So really pleased to introduce in this order, Isabel Axelson. Louis, Lu, Lukina Till, Vanessa Nakate, Greta Thunberg, Luisa Neubauer. After, off to you. We have noticed that throughout the WIF annual meeting that the general focus has not been on finding actual solutions and mitigating the climate crisis, but rather on developing technologies. We cannot rely on technologies that do not yet exist. We must use what we already have. Ceasing the behavior that is causing the emissions is crucial. However, it can only happen if the facts are taken into account. We got the feeling that VEF was closed in a bubble of positivity away from reality. But we are in a crisis. And for as long as we refuse to pop the bubble, we will live in lies and not change the fate of humanity. We need to look at climate justice from every perspective because we all have a story to tell. I'm camping with the Arctic Base Camp and we've been sleeping out in tents. This is to show you that we've left our comfort zones. There is someone from Brazil, someone from China, someone from UK, we have someone from Greenland. We've left our comfort zones to show you that it is time for all of you to leave your comfort zones because it is the uncomfortable things that we'll do that will be able to save the planet. If it's uncomfortable for us to give up the fossil fuels, that will be what will save our planet. You have seen and ignored sufferings of different kinds of people. You've chosen the things to report but it is time to report stories from every part of the world because people are suffering from every corner of the world. Thank you. Um, and we must remember that as long as we do not treat this crisis as a crisis and as long as the facts and the science are being left completely ignored, then we will not be able to solve this crisis. We need to understand the urgency of the situation and we need to see this from a holistic point of view. And before we came here, um, we had a few demands for this WEF. Uh, and of course, those demands have been completely ignored, but we expected nothing less. Uh, because as I said, as long as the science and is being ignored, as long as the facts are not being taken into account, and as long as the situation is not being treated as a crisis, then world and business leaders can, of course, continue to, to ignore the situation and that they, they don't have to do anything because they are not being held accountable. So what needs to happen next? We noticed that um, at the WEF there seems that um, general optimism about the situation and about an obvious discourse change, which is nice. Um, as we hear, this is the first time the WEF has been focusing on the climate in such intensity. This is, of course, good, but we never striked for discourse change. From the first day onwards, we striked for actual climate action. So here at the WEF, we see and hear a lot of nice words and a lot of big speeches. And we expect throughout the next days and weeks and months, every single of those ones to be actually turned into action. And we will held, hold each of those um, speakers accountable. We will watch them and we will ask them to turn their words into action. At the WEF, there are some of the wealthiest and most fortunate companies, investment funds, and um, individuals assembled um, on the planet. 
And it is their money that is fueling this crisis. It is their money that is allowing this crisis to go on and to reach um, the standards of today. So throughout the year 2020, there needs to be a loud and large shift of all that money away from fossil fuels. This is our only chance to reach the Paris Agreement, to stick to 1.5 degrees, and to make sure that this catastrophe isn't turning into something that we can't even imagine yet. This is um, one of the many crucial tasks for this year. We are not talking of the far future, we are not talking of 2030, but we're talking of today. Because as the IPCC states very clearly, 2020 is the year, the only year we have left to make sure that we won't um, cross a 1.5 degree warming target. This is the year this needs to happen and we intend to demand that urgent action, that needed action throughout this year as it's the last one for 1.5 that we have according to the IPCC. Uh, just to add, of course, this is not the last year we have. For one, yes. Yeah. It's not the last year for climate action. Please don't write that down. It's, um, um, we need climate action all the time. It's um, just the pathways that we are taking right now are deciding about where we can get in the future. So we're going to have two microphones roaming. And there's a question here, and then just next to you. And before, before we answer questions, I'm just going to say that uh, Vanessa and I have the flu, so you will have to excuse our low energy level. <laughs> Thank you. Kathy Newman, Channel 4 News. Um, Greta, I wondered how it felt to be publicly insulted by the American president and the US Treasury Secretary. What effect does that have on you? Of course, no effect. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are being criticized like that all the time. And of course, if we would care about that, then we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Uh, <laughs> it's water what? off a duck's back. I'm oh, sorry? It's water off a duck's back. It goes straight over your head. Yeah, of course. I mean, we cannot care about those kinds of things. If we are... We have put ourselves in this spotlight and then we... We know that, as we said, people do not understand the situation. I mean the situation is not being treated as the crisis it is. And then, of course, people will criticize us because we are the ones who, who are telling this since basically no one else is telling this. So that's what, of course, we will receive these kinds of things. We, I mean, it's horrible, but what do you others think about that? We, uh, <clears throat> we know that the task that lies in front of us is quite big. So I think it's in all of our interest to focus on um, the things that we need to get done um, and leave um, disturbing parts to the side as we really don't have time or energy or capacity to lose. Russell, Russell Lynch from the Daily Telegraph. Um, Greta. Given that you said that your demands were completely ignored this week, do you think Davos is actually worth it from a, the carbon expended to get world leaders here? Uh, before I answer that question, I just want to encourage everyone to not only ask questions to me. Uh, I mean, we are not in a position to s say whether Davos is... is uh, good or bad from that perspective. Uh, I mean, we just took this opportunity to, to go here because this is, this is where many world and business leaders are gathered and we are not in a position to, to say such a thing. Um, I think that for Davos, it gave us an opportunity to talk about 
um, the things that we need and the climate action that we need. The only issue with it is that we keep getting more words and promises and not actions. Yeah. I agree. Um, Greta, my name is Vishnu Shom. I'm with New Delhi Television, India. We are a country of more than one billion, and yet climate change is not a political issue in India for any party. It doesn't decide elections. What is your message to various governments in India and the government of India on the importance of climate change for a country with a population of more than one billion? Uh, of course, my message to, to India is the same as I, as to every other country, as I, I don't focus on the specific countries I haven't done before. Uh, just that we need to listen to the science and we need to treat this crisis like the crisis it is. And uh, I'm going to hand over the mic to the others because I've already spoken so much. And I think the others should also have a chance to say something. I think that answer said all of it. Okay, just here. Thank you very much. Uh, John Defterius with CNN, and this is a question uh, for Greta because it came up during the roundtable I was chairing uh, yesterday. Uh, we have a position now that's been declared to get out of fossil fuels. Uh, you have a U.S. president who suggests that this is all speculation and alarmist. How do you find the center where we're actually reducing carbon emissions and find compromise? Uh, I mean, can I hand over that question? Because I'd love to have you address it because it came up during the round table. So we have, it's great that you've identified an opportunity here to, to get the world's attention. And you have a U.S. president that's not part of the Paris Agreement. How do you take this Davos community and advance it where we see carbon reduction, <coughs> carbon emissions rose in 2019? So how do we actually go to solutions at this? Why don't, I think anyone can answer that question. Yeah, You've spoken I enough. So. I think you know you want the other folks to have a word. I don't think it should be that difficult to overgo to solutions. At the moment, we're just speaking. I think as soon as the politicians actually listen to what the science is saying and discuss things within themselves and actually take action, write it down on paper and do it, that's all is needed, really. Hi, my question is to Lukina. Uh, we briefly met last year in Lausanne, and you co-organized the Smile Summit. And I was just wondering, the next Smile Summit was, will be held in Turin, right? And I'm just wondering, when will it be held, and what's, what will you, your role in it? What will be your role? Um, the dates are not fixed yet, so it's still being worked out. Um, I will be a normal participant, and I don't know yet if I will be going, because I also want to give the chance to other people from Switzerland to go. Um, I will, of course, help the people organizing uh, if I can give some tips to how to deal with those situations. Um, but I don't have a special role there. So, Mini Sangupta from the New York Times, anyone can answer this question. You spoke of holding people accountable um, over the course of this year. Can you say how you plan to do that and what exactly do you want them to do? and uh, on what target, uh, and on what timetable? Of course, I can, in this instance, not speak for everyone and uh, um, every climate activist for Fridays for Future worldwide. Um, maybe coming from a German perspective, where we had uh, a very um, eventful um, time recently with Siemens, who is um, building um, infrastructure for the Adani mine in Australia. Um, and in this context, for instance, uh, we very um, directly addressed Siemens and their CEO, Joe Kayser, asking to um, drop this contract and to not cooperate with the Adani mine project. As we know, is if Adani opens as planned, the two degree target is in severe danger. So um, there is no way um, that this, all this coal can be mined. Um, we had discussions, I had discussions with um, Joe Kayser. Um, we were protesting in front of um, Siemens um, company locations across the country in Germany. 
and we plan to speak at the AGM of Siemens in Munich in February. Um, and I believe the fact that uh, Joe Kayser and us meet, met and uh, that actually there has been a discussion on the involvement of Siemens and the Adani mine kind of speaks for the fact that at least there was some pressure um, built up on Siemens. And obviously we won't give up on that. Um, Lucy White from the Daily Mail. Um, thank you all for speaking. And it, it strikes me that a lot of the people behind this event and a lot of people who are participating in this event are wealthy, powerful men. Why do you think it is that it is taking a, a young panel like yourself to actually get them to listen to these problems? And do you also think that you actually are being listened to? Or do you think that they're sort of seeing you as a novelty um, that is good to listen to, but they're not actually going to take in anything that you say? Um, one thing I'm sure of is that they are listening to us. They listen to us, but they either choose to ignore or to do something about the demands that we are requesting for. And for the business leaders and uh, the people in power, they, they have the authority and all, all the guts to save us from uh, this planet. So we've done all we've had to do, but it's all up to them. But one thing I'm sure of is that they're listening to us. If they don't act, it's because they're ignoring it. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Guy Ronick from The Marker. Uh, do you think after you visited Davos here in the last uh, few days that actually uh, business people are the wrong audience and we shouldn't wait for them to do anything voluntarily. And we should, the real audience is only the politicians, perhaps captured by those business people. Um, of course, this is the right audience. Everyone is the right audience since, since uh, I mean, both the finance, the business sector, and, and the political. Of course, everyone needs to do something, so everyone is the right audience. We shouldn't be focusing about who's, which sector is most r responsible, which sector has to do most, because all we need to push from every direction, and this, needs, this change needs to, to come from every direction. And maybe to add to that, um, as Greenpeace has recently, this week actually published, since the Paris Agreement was signed, there was far more than one trillion US dollars invested in new fossil free projects. So obviously there needs to be changes within the money flows, within the ways that projects are insured, um, the way that companies invest or divest. So as we address everyone, I think, um, Davos is a good place to come as a climate activist. Mandeep Rai from the Values Compass. Um, I think it's great that you're here and representing. I think it's really interesting that you're all female. Um, I do think that we're talking about a long-term solution and a long-term problem, and politicians are generally only looking at the short term and getting elected again. So given that's the case, how can we help you? How can we also men and others get a position at the table so that we, we can support you? What would you like? I think the media needs to start reporting about the crisis and the climate more than they are reporting about us as people. At the moment, there is an insane focus on climate activists and on people, and they are not speaking about carbon budgets. They are not speaking about the facts. The media really needs to start reporting what is needed to be done, not only sensational headlines. And also, if I can just add to that, um, report about the, the very facts. And when people will see the very facts, they will more focus on the long term and see that short term, um, what they want to do on the short term maybe needs to be put in a different perspective compared to what will happen in the long term, I guess. Um, where I come from in, um, in Uganda, that's in Africa, most people believe what they watch on the media. So it's really helpful if you try and report the, um, the disasters that happen as a result of the climate crisis and try as much as possible to relate them to climate change because it is really hard 
educating an entire country or an entire continent by ourselves as activists. So media reaches are wider. And so with that, you can help us try to report the crisis and, um, and the solutions that we offer. Hadass Gold, uh, also with CNN. Um, I'm sure this week you've met with a lot of interesting and powerful people. Uh, could you by chance name names and tell us who you've met with, what they may have promised to you, and if uh, and uh, what they have talked to you about? Uh, it would be very interesting to hear because I'm, a lot of people here have been enamored, as you said, by you as people. So maybe it would be helpful for all of us to, to know who you've talked to and what they've said to you, and that will help hold them to account. Um, we don't want to focus on individuals. I mean... Everybody has a responsibility to solve the climate crisis. And some people, of course, have more responsibility than others, but we don't want to point out at individuals. Of course, we have met many people that have a lot of responsibility resting on their shoulders, uh, but we don't see it as our place to point them out. I um, had a um, meeting with Joe Kayser. That's not an energy producer, though. It's a, of course, as you know. <laughs> Um, well, maybe um, so much on that. I don't think there has a lack, um, been a lack on reporting about the fact that Greta and other climate ac activists are at Davos and um, on the reporting side. And I am pretty confident that those energy leaders here at Davos are well aware that they're climate activists like us who pound out at the science. And um, in their position, they surely have um, access to the best available science, just um, like many others do. And I'm optimistic that if they wanted to, they could um, inform themselves about the science there is and about the action that needs to be taken. Hi, this question is for everyone. Um, can you talk a little bit about how social media has affected this movement? And do you think that it's helping the cause here? Um, personally, it has been helpful for me because bec um, because of social media, um, my activism has been able to spread across Uganda and Africa and impacted some people to join the climate activism. So it has been good for me. It definitely helped to spread the word. Yeah, I think uh, one of the reasons why I think Fridays for Future and the climate strike movement has become so big is because we have access to control our own media and to control how we get our voices out in a way that uh, future generations have not. Uh, yeah, so I think it has been a very important tool in how we have mobilized. We have two minutes left. One question here. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and for your speaking about... I'm Lynette Walworth. I'm an artist from Australia. Yeah. Do you have a question? I have a question. Um, I, want, I wonder if you can speak to the loss of one billion animals in these most recent fires in Australia and the message around present over future thinking in terms of climate. Um, about that, it is really sad that we've lost um, billions of animals, um, especially in the Australian fires. But it's also important to note that um, in Africa, we've really had crazy floods as a result of extreme weather conditions. And these have killed millions of animals as well. It's just that media is kind of biased, so you choose what to report. Mm. So it's really sad that we've lost millions of animals from uh, various parts of the world, but not just animals, even people are dying. So we, we really need to do something to stop this. It's a massacre. 
maybe the one lesson from those fires across the globe, not just Australia, but um, African countries, um, South America, there's one lesson and it's um, really about don't wait for the apocalypse to come. People often say, well, when the, the crisis emerges, when it's right in front of our doorstep, then we will act. Where you look around and the crisis is there, a house is literally on fire, and what we see are continued investments in fossil fuels, um, continued leaders who ignore the facts. Uh, we see um, climate ignorance going on. We see maybe less climate denial, but we see more climate action denial. Um, so um, I think this should you know, really be a warning for us that um, despite all the losses, there has never been a point in waiting for the crisis to actually come up because it is here now and it is our job and especially a job of um, media um, to wake up to this and to pre-report on that. Last question just here. Benedikt von Imhoff, German press agency, DPR. Um, you were mentioning Mr. Kaiser already, and now he has claimed that you're refusing uh, a cooperation, and the more you refuse yourself, you would forfeit your moral claim to criticize. What uh, would you answer him, Ms. Neubauer, or any other, of course? Thank you. You mean about the seat on the board of uh, Siemens? Well, in total, yes. He, he was claiming that you just maybe also the seat on the board and every other thing that you would only be criticizing but not cooperating. Um, I feel as a climate activist who fights for a future and uh, for the Paris Agreement, um, it is part of the job descri description to hold people like Joe Kayser and uh, many others, not just him, accountable. Um, his job would be to act um, responsibly, as responsible as he can. Um, and uh, he knows that. I, um, we had a very um, good discussion here at Davos, so I think um, the dialogue is still going on and um, will continue. Um, at the same time, we urge all investors or companies that are currently responsible for um, making fossil fuel projects happening to realize what their responsibility is right now. and. Uh, our message to Joe Kayser is the same as to all other CEOs and investors in those projects. If you add up all the contracts that have been signed by today on fossil fuel projects, we will be beyond, far beyond two degrees. So some of those contracts, if not all of them, they will have to be cancelled if we want to actually do something about Paris. Um, this is not a radical demand, this is a rational demand. Um, this is uh, what he knows by now, and I'm sure he tells um, his colleagues. Thank you very much. I think that's all for now. That's all for now, but there'll be more chance for you to ask questions down at, uh, at Post Plots. Okay, no, that's it. We're going to let them um, leave and get ready for the march, okay?